Welcome or welcome back to Twisted Minds. My name is James and today we're going to be doing an in-depth look at the personal life and crimes of Thomas Zvekla, better known to Canadians as the Boogeyman. This is a truly disturbing man who preyed upon young women throughout the 80s and 90s. He would spend his free time hunting vulnerable street workers, claiming the lives of countless women and dumping their bodies near the eastern edges of Alberta. Thomas has since been locked away, however, the story of his life and what led to him becoming one of Canada's most brutal serial killers of all time continues to rattle around in the hearts and minds of Canadian law enforcement as they do their best to prevent these heinous murders from ever seeing the light of day again. As we begin this case, I should tell you straight away that we don't know too much about the early years of Thomas Speckla's life. He hasn't revealed much to the press or the police, but we do know that he became an automotive mechanic when he was younger and continued to hold this job for many years. It doesn't seem like the police had any reason to suspect him of being a criminal at first, as it seemed like he was just a young guy who had his life held together quite well. However, beneath the surface, something was brewing inside Thomas leading him to fantasize about committing terrible crimes against young women. Thomas's crimes were so frequent and so gruesome that the police department felt a need to create a special task force, known as Project CARE, to help put an end to his reign of terror. This project was put together in 2003 after more than a dozen bodies of mutilated women had been found in Alberta. At the time of creating this task force, police estimated that the perpetrator had taken the lives of at least 20 young women. But some reports seem to suggest that this number could have been much higher. You have to keep in mind, this is only the number of bodies that police have physically found. There is no telling how many bodies may still be out there, just waiting to be discovered. Investigators soon learned that virtually all of the women who were found had one trait in common. They were all considered to be lower class citizens who made a living off street work, or to put it more bluntly, these women would sell sexual favors to pretty much anyone who was willing to pay. Police considered the lives of these women to be high risk, and that certainly seems to be true, considering the many diseases and infections that can come with this line of work. It's especially dangerous when you are tasked with being incredibly vulnerable with a person you've never even met before. They could pretty much do anything to you and you'd be completely powerless to stop it. While there is certainly a lot of controversy about the lifestyles of these young men and women who pursue this line of work, I can think we can all safely agree that street workers live an incredibly dangerous life and are by all means some of the most vulnerable people in our society. To really dig deep into the crimes of the boogeyman, we need to take a look back in time. All the way back to 1983 when police discovered the first body related to Thomas's evil desires. The dates around this case are a bit unclear, but sometime in 1983, police were informed of a body belonging to a young woman that had been found about 10 kilometers from Fort Saskatchewan. Police didn't have any information about the young lady, but after a somewhat brief investigation, they found out that she was a 21-year-old, Gail Cardinal. Again, the details are super vague, but investigators were able to determine that this young lady had been a street worker for quite some time before she went missing. We don't know if some of her friends or co-workers may have told investigators about this or if it was simply clear by just looking at her. Whatever the case may be, RCMP officials felt that her death was a homicide. But they didn't have any leads to go on, so the case sat unsolved for many years. At the time, this was the only body that investigators had discovered. What had been done to Gail's body was incredibly brutal, but police had no reason to believe that they were dealing with a serial killer. It would be another three years before officials would find the next body. But at the time, they had no reason to believe that the cases were related. The next victim would appear on September 21st, 1986. Melody Rigel had been working as a street worker for a short while. She was only 21 years old and was known to have had many clients during her short career. Police never revealed much about her personal life, but we know that she was last seen alive when she was entering a hotel with one of her clients. She would not be seen again until the following day when her body was found 
lying on a hotel bed. Investigators did not reveal the cause of her death, but considering how violent many of these other cases were, it's pretty safe to assume that the state of her body was likely pretty rough, all things considered. A couple years later, on September 13th, 1988, the body of Georgette Flint was found in Elk Island National Park. At this point, it still doesn't seem clear that the police felt that the cases were connected. But, as we later find out, they're connected all right. They investigated the body and found that the victim had likely passed away from homicide. But an exact cause of death was never determined. Without this bit of vital information, police found themselves at a dead end. Georgette's case went cold as quickly as it had begun, and her friends and loved ones were left begging for answers. After the death of Georgette Flint, the killer's process began to speed up at a rapid pace. He would strike again just a year later in October of 1989. It was October 25th, 1989, when Burnett Anaku would meet her end. Burnett had been doing her best to raise her three young children when she met Thomas. We don't know anything about the relationship between the two or what led to her eventual death, but Thomas claimed her life and then tossed her body in a ditch near Shearwood Park. This behavior shows how little regard Thomas had for the dignity of lives of the women that he met. He felt so off-put by them that he would be willing to toss them into a ditch after he was finished with them. The next victim would pop up in 1990, exactly one year after the death of Burnett. The details of this case are largely unknown, but police reported that 29-year-old Mavis Mason was found stabbed to death on the side of a road just a few miles west of Edmonton. After the death of Lorraine Ray, Thomas would take a break for a few years. Lorraine Ray was a 46-year-old masseuse and a mother of one child. She was found after she had been seemingly strangled in her own bathroom, located at her masseuse business in Edmonton. It seems the killer had been one of her clients, but he turned on her without warning and ended her life, leaving her to be found by whoever happened to walk into the building next. By February of 1993, Thomas's crimes had become even messier than before, and it seemed as though he was simply using whatever tools were at his disposal to claim the lives of his victims. On February 11th, police found the body of 25-year-old Elaine Ross, stuffed underneath a bed in a motel room. She had been spending a few hours with a client at a motel room near Stony Plain Road, but investigators have no idea how she lost her life. Thomas would then go on to take a three-year break, only to return in 1996 on Christmas Day. On December 25th, police were informed about another body that had been found in an apartment building nearby. When they went to investigate, they found the mutilated remains of Joanne Ghostkeeper. The problem is that the police couldn't determine anyone who may have wanted to harm Joanne, so they had no suspects in her case. Without any leads to go on, her case went cold almost immediately, but the hunt continued for additional victims. Less than a year later, in October of 1997, yet another body would show up. This time it was found in Shearwood Park. Police say that they took a look at the body of Joyce Hewitt, and knew that she'd been involved in a high-risk lifestyle. She was quickly identified, but the search for her killer, as usual, hit a dead end very quickly. After this, two more bodies were found in 1997, but the next victim would not be located until 2001. You'd think by the early 2000s, they'd had the technology to identify Thomas at some point, just from the evidence left at the scenes of one of these murders. In 2001, the body of Kelly Don Riley was found dumped behind a gravel pit near a popular highway. In 2002, the body of Edna Bernard was also found near a highway. In 2003, the bodies of Monique Petre, Melissa Munch, Debbie Lake, and Katie Ballantyne were all located, but no clues were ever left behind by the criminal. At this point, there's so many victims, it feels like I'm just throwing around dates and making up names, but these are all real people with real lives. By 2005, another six bodies would be found. A year later, they would find the body of Bonnie Lynn Jack, after her remains had been dumped near a rural area of Shearwood Park. May I add, the first victim I mentioned to you was from 1983. This man was killing consistently for over two decades. By late 2006, police were hot on the heels of Thomas Svekla, and there would soon be a major break in the case that would change everything for both Thomas and the families of these poor victims.
Police knew that they were now dealing with a serial killer, but they had no means of identifying or finding him, as everyone who had likely seen the guy had now turned up dead. However, investigators would get their lucky break when Thomas's sister called in to speak with authorities about a shocking discovery inside of her garage. Thomas had visited his sister's house and asked if it was okay to store a duffel bag in her garage for a while. She asked him what was inside and he told her that it was filled with compost and worms. I'd assume he likely explained that he was going to use the worms in his garden, but we don't know much else about their conversation. After Thomas left for the day, his sister's curiosity got the better of her and she decided to go back into the garage to check out what was supposedly in this bag. She said that the bag was filled to the top and was bulging at the seams. If there were worms inside, there would have been thousands of them. His sister opened the bag and to her horror, she was met with the body of a young woman who had been wrapped in metal wire, strapped together with plastic sheeting, and then stuffed inside a deflated air mattress. I would assume that he added all of these extra layers to further conceal the young lady's body, but there was no fooling his sister. She knew what she had just found and immediately called the police to investigate. When authorities arrived, they identified the body as a missing young woman named Teresa Eines. As I'm sure you've already guessed, Teresa was a street worker who had gone missing just a short while ago. None of her friends nor family had any idea where she had gone, but it seems as though Thomas had likely kidnapped her and held her captive for a short time before trying to dispose of her body. It's at this point that the case begins to get a bit muddy because some of the details surrounding Thomas's crimes have been misreported by several news outlets, so we don't really know what is true or false in terms of the timeline of events. We know that police discovered the body of Teresa in 2006, but some reports seem to claim that Thomas was not arrested until 2009. By all means, this doesn't seem to be true, as there are other records that show that he was convicted as early as 2008. Whatever the case may be, the timeline is somewhat irrelevant. Thomas was quickly taken to trial and charged for the death of Teresa, as well as two other young women. He wasn't charged in the dozen or so other deaths because investigators didn't have enough evidence to prove he was involved in any of the other murders. However, when you and I take a look at all of these cases as they have been laid out, it seems pretty clear that Thomas was most likely to blame for nearly all of them. Once police had Thomas in custody, they did their best to get answers out of him, but it soon became clear that he had no intentions of speaking or answering their questions. He chatted with them for a little while, but soon began to tell officers that he needed his anti-anxiety medication. Once he brought this up, officers say that it was virtually all he would talk about, asking them to bring his medication anytime they would try to talk about the case. As soon as officers told him they had enough evidence to charge him with murder, he replied, I think the doctor screwed up on this prescription. This charge came just a few hours after police showed up at his family's home to arrest him in the case of Teresa Eines. He was taken to court just a short while later and the court found him guilty in the case. However, at the same time, prosecutors were trying to get him convicted for a string of other murders, but none of these charges stuck. The courts didn't feel as though there was enough evidence to hold against him, so he was freed from all these charges. However, at the end of the day, he still received the maximum punishment and was condemned to serve life in prison. Police have continued to find human remains that they believe may be a result of Thomas's sick crimes. As recently as 2015, they found another body of a woman who likely disappeared sometime in 2004. They have not been able to positively identify the woman as one of Thomas's victims, but Considering how similar her death was to the dozen of other victims and the time frame of the attack, the world seems to believe that Thomas was likely involved. However, we do have to be careful about making claims like this because there is a huge chance that there could be another killer out there, maybe even a copycat. Thomas doesn't seem to have preferred any specific way of dealing with his victims. Rather, he would simply take their lives using whatever means were available to him at the moment. For him, I'm sure that this was part of the thrill. Either way, it's good news that the woman has now been identified, but we certainly hope police plan to keep digging until they get to the bottom of her case. Since his conviction, police have been tight-lipped about Thomas and the cases that are stacked against him. For now, they are not willing to discuss his case publicly any longer, and they often shut down any reporter who tries to get the inside scoop about other cases that are possibly connected to Canada's boogeyman. 
For the moment, it seems as though this demented killer is finally off the streets. However, authorities are going to do their best to rule out another killer as being potentially responsible for the death of these women. We can certainly hope that Canada's boogeyman is now serving life in prison, but there is always the possibility that there is more to this case and Thomas than meets the eye. Thanks for tuning in to Twisted Minds. That was the case of Canada's boogeyman, Thomas Zvekla. Oh, and why don't you go ahead and click on one of the other two videos on the screen for another one of our videos.